Welcome and thank you for joining us for the third Agro Lunch and Learn webinar of 2024. This webinar series is only possible through the generous support from Eurofins AgroScience Services. We thank Eurofins very much for their continuing sponsorship. My name is Jim Schmidt, Associate Director of Business Development at Eurofins Regulatory Science Services. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. Attendees should use a Q&A tool to submit their questions and comments, which will be answered at the end of the presentation. Before I introduce our speaker, I'll highlight the benefits of becoming an Agro member. Agro pays enormous benefits by enhancing your science, building your scientific network, and supporting your professional development. Please add Agro Division to your ACS membership or go to agrodiv.org and click on Become a Member to become an affiliate for $20 a year, regardless of membership status with the American Chemical Society. I'd also like to inform you about the upcoming ACS Fall National Meeting in Denver this August. Registration and housing block reservations are open for the fall meeting for in-person and virtual attendance. If you have any questions about programming, contact our program chair, Dr. James Foster, see agrodivision.org for more details. Now I'm proud to introduce today's speaker. Matthew Von Hendy is noted for his experience and expertise in finding, organizing and disseminating scientific and technical information for his clients. He worked as a reference and research librarian for 20 years for science libraries in the Washington DC area, including US EPA, NASA, and the National Academies of Science. In 2012, he established Green Heron Information Services, an independent information consulting practice that specializes in scientific and business related research. Over the course of the last couple of years, he has helped clients with their PFAS-related projects and recently created the Faster Weekly Update, What's New with PFAS, and the Business of PFAS Weekly Newsletters on LinkedIn. His webinar today is entitled PFAS, Hemorrhoids or Hernias for Agro Division Members. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. I am actually going to, uh, to preserve bandwidth here I am going to share my screen and go off camera. Welcome to PFAS, hemorrhoids, or hernias for agro members. Let me offer a couple disclaimers before I start here. The information and suggestions offered during the presentation today are only for educational purposes and do not constitute legal, regulatory, or business advice. Um, Opinions are my own and are necessarily reflective of my employer, since I'm self-employed as the principal of Green Heron Information Services. Everyone, I've been working in scientific and technical information in one fashion or another for about the last 30 years. Um, my background, obviously, is as a research and reference librarian, but it's really only in the last um, two years or so that I've started doing more work with PFAS. And I've met a lot of people who are working on PFAS, uh, it, be it uh, chemical advise, advisory people, lawyers, uh, scientists, and everyone has their own journey of how they've become to be interested and passionate about PFAS. Um, I actually started working with PFAS with some clients that were working with the issue of firefighting foam, who were looking retrospectively at what scientists with different uh, U.S. government agencies might have known. And um, the longer I looked at the issue of firefighting foam, the more I became interested in the larger issue of PFAS since there's a, obviously a direct connection between the two. Um, there, there are a lot, PFAS is a complicated, interesting area. It intersects a lot of different uh, disciplines. 
uh, the regulatory area, the legal area, and obviously the chemical and different science spaces. And one of the things I wanted to recognize is that there are a lot of people who are even going to be on this webinar who are going to talk, uh, have the expertise to talk at great detail about specific topics that I will only skim over. And one of the things that you'll find is that the complexity of PFAS really necess necess necessitates that type of expertise. But my perspective is slightly different because of where I've worked, uh, the clients I've worked with, and also the two newsletters that I created uh, starting in January of this year on LinkedIn, the What's New with PFAS and the Business of PFAS. Um, I have somewhat of a unique perspective. It's a little bit more of what I can see over a lot of different topical areas. And I don't have a particular, one of the things that you'll find is, with PFAS is that folks typically, I don't wanna say have an agenda, but they have a point of view that's behind a lot of what they say about PFAS. And that's something that's good to keep in mind that there might be a little bit of an agenda So look, when I started working with PFAS and started looking at the area, I was finding all this disparate information that was really relevant. It could be notices from the US EPA or other federal ed agencies that were PFAS related. It could be uh, news articles from different sources that weren't uh, that were showing up. And I started to wonder if anyone was trying to gather this information in some type of systematic fashion. And the only thing I could find was that there were actually uh, most of the major environmental consulting outfits had a monthly PFAS newsletter, which was kind of geared to promote their own services, which is understandable. Um, there were a few other PFAS-related resources that were out there, but nothing uh, that was trying to capture this on a weekly basis. Um, I started the newsletters uh, just as a, I figured I might get 100 or 200 subscribers. As of last week, uh, one of the newsletters, the What's Up with PFAS, has nearly 1,800 subscribers on LinkedIn, and the other, the business of PFAS, uh, has close to 1,500 subscribers. The interest has been, uh, I've been surprised by how much interest there's been. So obviously this topic is on the mind of a lot of people. Let me talk about what I'm going to actually discuss today. The goals are to, I'm going to provide a kind of 30,000 30, foot overview of what's happening with PFAS in the different areas when it comes to uh, PFAS regulation and some and and the science behind that uh, with PFAS and two of the major challenges that are there, which I'll get into in a moment here. I'm also going to discuss the in a lot of ways the regulation is ahead of the science when it comes to PFAS, and this has created a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of other issues that are driving PFAS regulation that I'll talk about as well. The uncertain, the disconnect slightly between the science and the regulation provides really a puzzle for companies and businesses about how to respond. And I'll touch briefly about the different approaches that businesses are taking to uh, the PFAS regulations in the US primarily, I'll touch on Europe and the European Union briefly. Um, the second half of the presentation, I'll talk about some of the specific PFAS regulations and how they're gonna really affect agro division members, particularly who are involved in any supply chain management. And finally, I'll 
talk about some proactive steps that every all agro division members can take in preparation for uh, the PFAS re regulations and how you might be affected by them. So the question really comes in that everyone has about PFAS, or specifically about PFAS regulations, is how bad is it going to be? I was talking about three months ago with a financial analyst who was trying to rate one of the major chemical companies about uh, for institutional investors about whether or not they should buy or sell on the stock because of some PFAS related impact that was going on with the company. And the financial analyst I was talking to said to me, we, we've seen an entire range of modeling estimates about what the impact of PFAS is going to be. And in this particular case, the analyst uh, wanted to go with the least conservative estimate of how bad the impact was because they were actually talking, they wanted to, they wanted to give a very positive review of our, our positive recommendation to their institutional investors to buy the stock of this particular company. But what I indicated to the analyst was I would really take a close look at the, what's happening with the science, particularly in the peer-reviewed area. And I, I think the impact is gonna be pretty bad uh, in terms of companies. So really one of the questions is, how much money is at stake when it comes to, to PFAS? Estimates really range from hundreds of millions of dollars to billions. Um, as PFAS is coming into closer view and the deadline regulatory deadlines are getting closer, I've seen an estimate that the impact could be close to a trillion dollars on um, companies, consumers, and government agencies. So one of the things we talk about is in terms of damages, people immediately think of litigation, understandably. But there are other damages that are going to happen with PFAS. There are reputational damages to companies. Um, there's potential damage to brand, consumer brands from PFAS-related concerns. Two of the issues with damages that don't get as much press right now are really the increase, um, I, I'm sorry, not only to consumers, but companies really, are about the increased cost of seeking alternatives to PFAS chemicals. This is going to be a huge issue. And finally, the other thing that's overlooked is really the in increased cost to consumers. Uh, you're going to see this in higher water utility bills at first. But a lot of the costs for the PFAS alternatives that companies are used are going to be using are probably ultimately going to be passed on to consumers in terms of higher prices. Having said this, there's also a tremendous amount of money that's potentially going to be made from PFAS. Um, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of PFAS startups in the United States. They are offering a range of services. At this point, the primary concentration of startups are looking at the destruction or disposal of PFAS. Um, I get, I probably hear from two or three of these startups each week in relation to the newsletters. There are also potentially a lot of money that's going to be made by chemical consulting companies, other consulting outfits when it comes to PFAS, um, alternative suppliers of substances and treatments for PFAS substitution. 
And so that's something to kind of keep in mind of all this, that there, there is both a lot of money to be lost, but there is also a lot of money to be gained when it comes to the marketplace of, of PFAS and PFAS regulation. So there's kind of an entire business component to PFAS. I think that there's going to be more money that's going to change hands with PFAS than was involved in all of the asbestos and tobacco litigation and resolution combined. So that's something to consider. So let's talk a little bit about some of the PFAS basics. What are we really talking about? As you can see from the screen here, there's really no universally accepted definition of PFAS. Most definitions of PFAS really are compounds that are characterized as uh, containing carbon atom atoms that are linked to each other and bonded to fluorine atoms at most are available, or most are all of the available car carbon bonding sites. Uh, I offer two definitions of PFAS here that you'll see uh, that will be supplied in the chat. And There are many people on the webinar today who can give excellent webinars about the PFAS chemistry that are actually way kind of have a much more expertise knowledge than I do. So I'm just going to review some of the kind of things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, when it comes to PFAS, we're really specifically we're going to talk about two of the major PFAS chemicals in terms of regulation right now. These are PFOA and PFOS, but they are just represents an entire class of chemicals that involve you know, thousands of individual uh, chemicals. With the PFAS class of chemicals, there's an entire range of what these chemicals the composition of the chemicals. It's really complicated about how they're used and about potential treatments for their dis disposal or destruction. Um, PFAS chemicals, because of their qualities of stain resistance, water and oil, being resistant to stain, water and oil, uh, and also having great adhesive qualities are used in an incredibly wide range of commercial consumer industrial products, which probably everyone knows about on this call. Uh, PFA, PFOA and PFOS, which I mentioned, really are legacy chemical PFAS chemicals. Their production is been banned in the United States or outlawed by decree between the e, uh, EPA and the industry, but they are the most studied at this point and also the most regulated by EPA. Going back to the prior point about how comp, or uh, prior two points, there are going to be future uh, regulation of other PFAS chemicals that will, will be coming, but currently PFOA and PFOS are the most regulated. So everyone's going to have, it's probably anyone who's studied PFAS and PFAS regulation is familiar with the two critical problems that come up with PFAS when it comes to PFAS. The science, and this may be the most controversial thing that I'll say in the entire presentation here, but the science, particularly when it comes to direct connections between PFAS and adverse health effects in human in humans is unproven, at least when it comes to kind of real clinical medical hardcore evidence. There are, and I'll talk about the science here in a moment, um, but that is certainly one big issue right now. The other big issue obviously is how do you ban a chemical that's involved, is used in almost every aspect of human life or classic chemicals um, 
And so these are two big issues I'll talk about here uh, next. Um, and if this, this doesn't present, doesn't give you a headache thinking about how you're gonna respond to any type of regulation involving these chemicals, uh, then <laughs> uh, my hat's off to you. When I say the science is unproven, what do I actually mean by this? Um, one of the newsletters that I put out, the What's New with PFAS, one section of this shows the most current peer, it's a sampling of the most current peer-reviewed research that's been published about PFAS. Um, I probably highlight mm, probably between 10 and 12 articles each week in that newsletter. And three quarters of those articles talk about PFAS and adverse human health effects. This ranges everything to some examples, uh, liver, blood consumption, cardiac, metabolic, renal effects, DNA damage, um, and obviously cancer exposure. Um, probably 75% of the articles report on some potential link between PFAS chemicals and those adverse human health effects. But when it comes to actually proving beyond a reasonable doubt that PFAS is specifically causing those uh, adverse human health effects, really you need to have um, carefully done longitudinal studies over a period of years that control for all the ubiquity of PFAS um, and this is really a issue for the toxicologists out there who have the, this type of expertise. PFAS chemicals have only been really um, the ability to detect PFAS chemicals at a level where they can really be studied has only really been around and developed. I'd say for the last 15 or 20 years in some capacity. And obviously there have been big advances in the last um, five to 10 years. So there really hasn't been time to develop these longitudinal studies to the point where they can be published. Having said that the science is unproven, there are really strong suggestive links between PFAS and adverse human health effects. Um, I personally think that there is some type of connection, but when it comes to hardcore scientific evidence that you'll have in a court of law, um, I don't know if we're there. Let me put it that way. I think the be best app comparison to the science might be to what was known in the 1950s between the connection between cigarette smoking and various adverse health effects. There, people knew that there was something there but it wasn't until about another five or 10 years that there was a direct, a really unshakable connection that was proven between those two, between. And it wasn't until the mid 60s that the federal government started putting out, war requiring warning, pack, warning labels on cigarette packs, I think was in 1965. But having talked about the science being unproven uh, in terms of this degree of scientific certainty, it may be a moot point when it comes to damages related to PFAS. If a plaintiff attorney can convince a jury of the scientific evidence between PFAS and adverse human health effects, this is gonna open up a Pandora's box of potential liability for companies. And I think that there's enough suggestive evidence that's been compiled that this may happen in six months to possibly two or three years. And when that first plaintiff victory comes in terms of damages from a PFAS related human health effects, 
it is going to be a new era in terms of potential liability for companies that have PFAS, either manufacture PFAS or have PFAS potentially in their supply chains. The question always comes up, what is the safe exposure level for PFAS kind of related to what we're talking about? Um, My good friend Lyle Burgoon and a series of uh, a group of international collaborators published an article about PFOA here. And this is a graphic out of his article and using with his permission here on the range of uh, PFOA safe doses for human health and international collaboration. And this is uh, an, a really helpful graphic just looking at based on kind of the international scientific collaboration of what has been viewed as safe doses per PFOA. Um, this will have some impact when we talk about the um, some of the industry objection to some of the US EPA PFAS regulations, particularly when it comes to the national drinking water standards which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So with the P so the other issue is here is how do you ban all PFAS chemicals when they're used so often in products that people use every day and also commercial applications that are used everything from medical devices to semiconductors to uh, food stuffs and so forth and so on. Um, it's a complicated situation, uh, a common thing, theme. Um, the places that have instituted widespread PFAS bans or phase outs are finding that these are incredibly difficult to implement or regulate. A good ex case study is the state of Maine um, instituted the most widespread PFAS ban and phase out in 2021. Um, it was pretty well thought of. You know, they thought through a lot of different issues, but in, at least in theory, but in practice, after a year or two, it was amended just recently. Um, and the link is in the uh, chat there from the link from Safer uh, from the advocacy group Safer States. And what they found is basically that we'll talk about the state regulations in a little bit more depth, particularly the state of Maine here in a little bit, but they've just found that because of the complexity of the topic, they needed to revise what they were doing. So a lot of the questions come up now is, with PFAS regulation, why is it happening now? And I would argue for two reasons. This We're in a different era when it comes to chemical regulation. And PFAS is perhaps the first class of chemicals that's really a social media phenomenon. Um, I have colleagues who I work with or I've worked with projects on who describe the advocacy area as um, it's a little bit of a loaded term, so I put in quotes here, the fear factory machine, but what they do is kind of raise the alarm about potential connections between different chemicals and human health. These organizations um, make highly effective use of social media in a way that creates a much higher level of public awareness about potential uh, health risks of different chemicals than ever before. One example, it's really interesting, is a survey that was done by the League of Conservation Voters in Wisconsin uh, just about six months ago, if I remember correctly. And they said that, um, they, according to their poll, and granted they have a particular point of view, 70% uh, 
of Wisconsin voters thought PFAS was an issue that they were going to, you know, they were considering when they were making up their mind about who to vote for. If you think about that for a moment, that's kind of incredible that there, that there are chemicals that are being considered by voters to potentially influence how they're going to vote. Um, and that's certainly a direct result of PFAS, uh, I'm sorry, of social media and kind of the advocacy that the um, advocacy, the advocacy groups are using. The other thing that's driving PFAS regulation, I would argue, is because of this awareness, a lot of higher income consumers and voters are pushing for change. They're uh, urging their local and state legislators to enact or uh, PFAS phase outs or bans. And they're also being very active um, contacting companies, particularly with consumer goods, asking for uh, PFAS free products. I You could, if you haven't heard the term PFAS washing, you're going to hear it very soon. Uh, the idea that you know, you're going to get rid of uh, PFO, PFOA or PFOS in a product and just replace it with a different type of PFAS chemical. Um, I think that's going, going to be a potential issue, but it's really out of my expertise to say whether or not it's possible to make uh, PFAS free consumer product, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. One of the things you have to consider with all this is the business reactions to the overall, to kind of the entire movement towards PFAS regulation and I call it FDA, and obviously it's not the federal agency that, you know, Food and Drug Administration. You know, basically there are three reactions businesses are having. They're fighting it either tooth and nail, they're seeking delays, or they're adapting to what the current climate is. Um, I'm going to kind of speed up here a little bit. The fighting really that's going on right now is you'll see in two major ways. There are lawsuits that are being filed against the new PFAS regulations by different um, industry groups. The latest one was actually just filed yesterday to challenge the, the new EPA drinking water, national uh, drinking national standards for drinking water uh, for PFOS and PFOA and a couple other PFAS chemicals. Um, and the other that you should pay attention to right now are lawsuits that are pending before the Supreme Court about the re regulatory authority of EPA. And while these lawsuits don't specifically talk about PFAS regulations, they could potentially have um, a major effect about the agency's ability to regulate PFAS. There are lawsuits that are being filed directly. Having said that, there are lawsuits that have just been filed in federal court that will take a while to get to the Supreme Court. Um, and one that is coming up soon, that's kind of winding its way through, is the city of San Francisco challenging EPA's uh, PFAS regulations. That's another one to kind of keep in mind. A lot of companies are trying to seek a delay in the implementation of PFAS regulations. Um, they're really seeking an exemption from compliance with the new PFAS regulations. Um, some of the regulations do have exemptions built in, uh, particularly for a lot of public water systems. But uh, one example is a Senate committee, that's, uh, a water coalition that's testifying recently before a Senate committee about uh, the importance of having a PFAS exemption from the new CERCLA uh, PFAS regulation. The other thing you're seeing are extensions of reporting deadlines that are being asked for um, and granted in a large degree. There are some companies that are trying to adapt to the new PFAS regulations. 
they are reaching out to their supply chain right now in a term in anticipation of the uh, new PFAS regulations and what's going to be upcoming. One example, I take a look at a lot of in the business of PFAS um, newsletter about the public, the SEC filings for public companies. And when they mention PFAS, and a lot of companies are starting to announce that they're phasing out PFAS in their pro consumer products. One example here is the outdoor supplier REI. So having said all this, let's talk about the specific things that will affect agro division members. Uh, talk about the specific regulations that will affect agro division members when it comes to their supply chains. This is kind of the more not 30,000 foot view. The chief one here that most agro division members need to be aware of is the EPA recently enacted the TSCA reporting and record keeping rule. It was finalized by EPA in October of last year. Um, someone described this. There's a link in the chat to the actual rule itself. This is, someone described it to this as the biggest data gathering effort by EPA, uh, and it's all concerned related to PFAS. It is a one-time report, a reporting rule that is going to be applicable to all manufacturing, including the import of all PFAS chemicals. Um, companies that are affected will need to report and anything that contains any amount of PFAS and this rule, unlike a lot of other Tosca rulemaking, does not include exemptions for things like by, byproducts, impurities, or most R&D activities. What is actually going to be required by this report ruling is that any manufacturing, including the import of any item with PFAS during the calendar year years from 2011 to 2022 need to be reported to EPA. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, this will include mixtures or articles, even as byproducts or impurities. Um, and also will include things that are been manufactured or solely are manufactured solely for test marketing or R&D activities. These will, companies also processing, distributing, using, or disposing of PFAS during the reporting period are not required to, to report. And there are certain uh, imports of municipal solid waste streams that are also exempted. Reporting deadlines are, for most companies, it's actually May uh, of next year. So we're talking less than a year at this point. Um, and the reporting standard, to use the EPA language, is what's known to, to or reasonably assertable by a, some form of due diligence. There is some in, um, guidance given in the EPA preamble to the reporting rule. The reporting information will include everything that you can read there. So it's a lot of different types of information. What I would say about this is if you have not talked to your um, folks that are working with your chemical regulatory area, uh, you want to do that soon. And I'll talk a little bit about taking some proactive steps here at the end of the presentation. I, a couple other recently enacted PFAS regulations that from EPA, from the US EPA that people should be aware of. Uh, PFOA and PFOS, PFOS, PFOS were really de recently designated as hazardous substances under CERCLA, under the Superfund law. And um, again, there's a link in the chat to the actual um, uh, rulemaking there. But this is more of a contamination issue than a per se a chemical management or supply chain issue for agro division members. If your company or the suppliers that you have connections with 
are affected by Superfund sites, and these include ones that are potentially potential current or closed ones, you want to be aware of how you might be indirectly impacted or your supply chain and your potential liability might be indirectly impacted by this rulemaking. The other one that may have some impact on agro division members in an indirect way is the National Drinking Water Standards for PFOA and PFOS. Again, there's a link in the chat to the actual regulation. This is really geared for drinking water and water. Um, it may have some, as I mentioned here in the slide, it may have some impact on the supply chain reporting, particularly if your company or suppliers deal with issues of wastewater, um, NIPTES permits, or your they're identified as potential sources of drinking water contamination. Um, with this regulation, EPA is going to be much more aggressive, at least according to a lot of the people I've been reading, um, in terms of trying to enforce uh, the contamination issues related to drinking water and specifically to PFAS. So just kind of keep that in mind. Again, this is something. Let's talk about another issue when it comes to PFAS regulations, and that is on the U.S. state level, not on the federal level. Um, a lot of states have, have enacted PFAS regulations, uh, specifically giving uh, phase-outs or bans of using chemical PFAS, uh, uh, PFAS chemicals in certain consumer products and industrial products. A few of these PFAS state requirements or state regulations have reporting requirements for the state. The state of Maine is perhaps the best known in this regard. Um, I mentioned that it was the 2021 Act was amended in 2024, and the most onerous component of the original Act had a general reporting requirement for all industry to the state of Maine about their PFAS usage. Um, that was taken out. They've enacted a more uh, specific set of requirements for certain industries. And so what I would suggest, again, is to check with your council or your chemical regulation consultants about this as well. But keep this in mind, this will be in addition to the state reporting requirements will be in addition to the U.S. federal PFAS regulations that are out there. I can't really do justice to the European Union here. There are people on, on the call here who could really do an entire webinar about PFAS regulations in the European Union. Um, this is kind of an evolving uh, situation. The European Union is actually going to adopt something that is known as the universal PFAS restriction that was introduced to the EU by five countries in uh, 2020. The Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Norway, and Sweden. The proposal is going through the EU decision-making process to various committees. It is expected to be adopted at some point next year. There are going to be exemptions for key industries and other uses. Um, obviously, this is a big deal, particularly for agro division members and the companies they work with who are dealing in an international context. In the meantime, individual European countries have enacted specific PFAS bans and phase outs, uh, much like the US states here. Um, Denmark is one example. They have had a national ban, uh, PFAS and paper. Uh, board food contact material since 2020, but they are just passed within the last um, six months, a ban on PFAS chemicals in clothing and shoes that's going to go into effect in, 20, in 2026 or until those uh, items are supplanted by the U uniform PFAS restrictions that the EU uh, is considering. So all this, 
Um, let me just kind of close here by saying uh, this can be overwhelming and it can be easy to kind of say, I don't want to deal with this or kind of, but it's coming. And my suggestion really is to be proactive. And what, and what specifically can you do? I would say to really become familiar with the existing and new PFAS regulations in the areas, areas you operate in. Um, I've touched on some of them. Uh, there are others that are out there that you want, will want to, anything that will affect you potentially and your supply chain, you want to be aware of. Um, follow the PFAS news closely. This is a really quickly evolving space. There are uh, things that are going to happen that will have a dramatic impact in a short period of time. Obviously, the EPA, the cases of the about EPA authority for the Supreme Court can have a major impact in uh, in a matter of days, but there are other things that are happening as well. So just kind of keep track of what's hap what's going on. If you have not done this within your organization, I would strongly suggest establishing a PFAS action team. This ideally would include your ESG and sustainability pe people, um, the folks that deal with your supply chain, um, obviously your general counsel and your government relations team. These are people, I, the folks that lobby. Um, all these people have an important role to play when it comes to PFAS just because of the, the interdisciplinary nature of what's going on with PFAS regulation. If you're in a small organization and you don't have people specifically assigned to working in these areas, do make rel rely on the expertise of your consultants or your trade association professionals. Uh, they can be really helpful in terms of kind of filling in some of the gaps for you. This is pretty self-explanatory about what I think the value within the context, larger context of what I talked about, about being proactive. Uh, obviously, you know, taking the steps to be in compliance with the regulations will keep you in legal compliance. Beyond, beyond that, it will really help reduce your risk profile for potential PFAS related liability. There are going to be, there's going to be a lot of PFAS related litigation coming in the next five to 10 years in a variety of ways. Um, having, knowing what your suppliers and what your, what PFAS is in your products and potentially from your suppliers is also will provide you with a good defense strategy and protection if you do face some type of PFAS litigation. The other two side benefits I would argue with being proactive is PFAS will really help streamline your organization in terms of being efficient when it comes to looking at chemical regulations and kind of reacting to them. And it will also provide you with invaluable public relations when it comes to PFAS. If you have consumers who are concerned about that issue, you can say, you know, we're taking action to remove PFAS. And let me just mention, how can I help? How can Green Information, Green Heritage Information Services help? We are um, the most consuming, kind of frustrating part about this entire process for not only agro division members, but everyone that's related, that's looking at trying to determine what uh, PFAS may be in, used by your suppliers, both downstream and upstream from you, in your manu manufacturing or consumer supply chain is trying to figure out, you know, what's there and taking the time and effort to do this. Um, some of this information is not going to be publicly available. Uh, a lot of businesses, suppliers are claiming that it's confidential business information and there's an entire series of litigation that's going on in that regard between suppliers and manufacturers, or law firms are representing manufacturers. But some of this information is publicly available. And if it is, my expertise can help save you some frustration and time locating it. 
I'll mention, I mentioned the two LinkedIn newsletters. This is a good way of staying up to date with what's going on. Uh, the links are in the chat. One is called the PFAST or weekly update. I just call it what's new in PFAST this week, which covers the peer reviewed journal, uh, journal literature, uh, kind of local and state business news uh, or uh, local and state, I shouldn't say business news, kind of consumer news, uh, kind of general news so about PFAS. It also covers things such as uh, federal register notices and kind of alternative reports about PFAS from other sources. The business of PFAS covers new patents in PFAS, business content, um, public filings from SEC or SEC public filings uh, from publicly owned companies that mention PFAS and uh, kind of some of the self-reports or press releases from the PFAS startups. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, please do. There may email and my cell phone. If you want to get in touch and talk about what's, you know, if you have concerns or questions, I'm glad to chat. And finally, thank you so much for attending, taking some time out of your day. Hope this has been helpful. And please let me know what questions you might have. And I'm gonna turn on my video here. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, this is Jim. We do have a few, um, a few questions. One is the most difficult attribute following the regulatory definitions of PFAS with a lack of uniformity in definitions worldwide. Is there a tool that captures the definitions of each geography rolling out regulations? Uh, <laughs> I, I'd be interested in finding out if there was. Uh, my suggestion would be, um, and I'm not promoting specific I, I know there are a number of um, very, very good um, chemical consulting companies that are out there. I, I, I will mention that I think Ascent um, and Chemsec are, may have tools that are related to that, that are tracking the definitions of PFAS from the different um, international regulatory bodies that are out there. Thanks, Matt. Um, another good question um, is um, related to not maybe the PFAS themselves, whatever those definitions are, but precursors like hydrofluoric acid, which you know are well studied, but also very highly tech toxic um, environment and humans. Do you see much activity in terms of precursor type of chemicals also? Um, I, I'm going to pun, pun on that question because I, I feel like there are people that are much more, uh, are, have much more expertise that could be helpful in answering that than I would. I, I would, I, I think there are particular scientists out there who are working on this issue who could probably provide a much, uh, provide a pretty clear thought about that. My personal, Thanks, you, okay. Um, just a, a last question here, and you kind of touched on this during the, the, the talk. Um, it's just about toxic tort litigation. Do you think that, um, given how long it actually had to happen for the, the tobacco industry, as an example, you expect it to be accelerated for PFAS and, and maybe why? <laughs> I, I, well, I think what's most telling about this are the, the chemical companies that have faced uh, potential litigation. Um, that you're talking about places like DuPont and Kenmore's. I mean, obviously they've spun off, but they made calculations about they're they're paying out literally billions of dollars, and I think their estimation is that it that it it's more money up front in the short term, but the long term uh, costs 
are going to be worse than that. Um, you know, I'm not privy to any of that, but I kind of think that my 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 personal feeling is that it's going to be quicker than the tobacco litigation, uh, partially because of the issues what we talked about with social media and consumer um, consumer uh, prodding of companies to change things. I think that there's uh, more of an organized system of plaintiff attorneys out there <laughs> than there was with tobacco things, but that's my personal opinion. Um, it, it's an interesting question. Thanks, Matt. And then just a known question to myself. Um, I mean, I think the attendees here are going to be um, really familiar with the, the scientific literature because they're exploiting that for so much else that we do. But given your resources and practice, what are some unexplored or untapped information resources that the audience should know about? Um, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question too, just because most PFAS research right now is really happening internationally. So anything you have that has good international scientific coverage, is a good place to look for PFAS related research. And one of the things I would suggest um, in terms of, you know, I've got a, a, a US bias here because that's the environment I work in, but some tools that people underutilize for PFAS when it comes to things are even basic things like PubMed, which is a publicly available database most people are familiar with but it has a tremendous amount of PFAS-related content that's there, and including stuff that's beyond human health. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, okay. Well, we'd like to thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. I'd like to thank Matt Von Hindi for an excellent job, as well as Eurofins AgriScience Services, our sponsor, and our webinar coordinator, Kyle Sawyer. For those questions that we did not get to, please expect answers to those questions to be posted in the next few days. You may be asked to complete a follow-up survey after the webinar, and we look forward to your feedback. Our next webinar is on September 11th at 12 Eastern Time, featuring Lacey Brown, who will speak on product chemistry testing on biological products. And knowing Lacey, I'm very excited to, to hear about that. Um, I'm sure it'll be a great presentation. If you have any ideas for future webinars, please contact Solito Sumalong, the chair of the webinar committee. Thank you for all of your attention, and we'll see you on September the 11th.